I've been playing Beyond the Beyond because you have no time to game. Beyond the Beyond was released in 95 in Japan and 96 in North America for PlayStation. That's PlayStation 1. And was developed by Camelot Software Planning of Shining Force fame and published by Sony. It took me somewhere in the region of 30 to 40 hours. Can't say exactly how long because uh, I managed to screw up the time keeping on it. So what is Beyond the Beyond? Beyond about? Beyond while in a time? Beyond time, beyond time, a battle was fought between light and dark. As you know, it always is. But actually, before destroying the world, the two sides decided to sign a treaty. Splitting it so, the surface was going to the forces of light, and the underworld to the forces of darkness. And after a few millennia of realising that they got the short end of the stick, the forces of darkness are once again on the move. So enter Finn. A young boy of somewhat dubious origins to set out with his buddies to stop firstly a classic evil empire before moving on to a more classic evil villains while going on a MacGuffin hunt to collect the things to stop the bad guys you know pretty standard <laughs> JRPG affair really honestly the story is probably about as generic as you can get and while in some cases this is a JRPG of this style it means the game is somewhat lacking and even boring at times Nothing truly unexpected happens, and the twists aren't particularly twisty. So yeah, if you want to make one example of what non-JRPG players think about JRPG stories, I think this is it. <laughs> Gameplay-wise, it's a traditional turn-based affair. Menus, random encounters, world map, dungeons and everything. So I always natter on about the outside of the battle first, before getting into combat. And in this game's case, as previously stated, it's very classic. You move from town to town, each town having an item and weapon shop, which you always check out to see if there's any shiny new gear, and interest in and recover, and also has the Shining Force Church to save your game, revive their party members, and cure any negative status effects. Once you're done in the towns, you'll travel the overworld mostly by foot, until later in the game when you acquire your first boat, and then actually two kind of interesting modes of transport, but they're kind of spoilers, so you'd have to play the game to find out what they are. But it's one of the few interesting things about the game. From this, you'll enter dungeons. Now, in many cases, these are basic maze affairs full of random encounters. But there are also a ton of puzzle dungeons, still with random encounters, by the way. What sort of puzzles? You have the classic ice sliding puzzles, invisible floors, block moving, all sorts. There's just a, quite a lot of puzzles to dig into. <laughs> The game then does have one more feature at Shining Force. At a certain point, you'll get to a town that'll allow you to promote your units. Something that moves you from your current class into a more advanced class. There's only one level. So you start with a basic class and then move to the next one. And you can use this shiny new class to get weapons, learn some new magic, and it also sends you straight back to level one, Shining Force style, which gives you an initial boost of leveling at the start and being a more advanced class, you gain more stat points for each level, and you don't lose your, your level. Yeah, you don't lose your stats in this one, so don't worry. You can promote when you're ready. My general advice is, if you're going to play this game, aim for at least level 30 before promoting. That'll give you the the best power boost. You can go up to like 40, I think, but you don't need to go that far. Just a note on the classes as well. Each character has a very specific class, which cannot be changed. And what they advance into is also set as well. And it basically defines their role in combat. So physical attacker, magic attacker, healer, etc. Nothing particularly special here. So what do our characters actually look like? Well, they have the basic stats you'd expect, except for health. It's not HP. It's split into two, LP and VP. VP stands for vitality points. And that will go down when you get hit. It's that's kind of like your standard HP. Then you have LP, which is life points. When your character hits zero VP points, LP is then used the next turn to bring them back into the fight. So your character isn't dead until they hit zero LP and VP. Each character also has their own inventory. So each character also has their own inventory, which is limited. Um, 
and they could they'll have a weapon, armor, accessory, all specific to them, like what they can equip. Um, but they take up part of your inventory space, so you'll always lose at least three <laughs> three spaces of your inventory to those. And then you can also equip a, a ring as well as an extra item, so that's four of your spaces gone. Um, so yeah, it's again limited inventory. <laughs> Uh, beware of cursed items as well they curse you with weakness so a lot of the most powerful weapons in the game are cursed but the curse itself then gets rid of some of that benefit but yeah <laughs> I mean it's kind of pretty obvious you'll probably fill out the rest of the inventory with various healing accoutrements the last thing you might do outside of combat is set your characters up for their battlefield position Basically, there are three front row fighters and two back row. You choose who you want in the position. The front rows tend to get attacked more, so make sure the doodlings in the front have decent defense. So yeah, it's traditional shenanigans. It's traditional shenanigans with promotion, limited inventory, puzzles galore. All leads us to a battle system, which is again turn-based, traditional turn-based, with the menu options that you'd expect: attack, magic, item, guard. But there are a couple of twists to this. Firstly, at the start of each round of combat, you get to choose attack or run, or change tactics. Attack and run are self-explanatory, but tactics is pretty interesting, as it allows you to choose an AI for your characters if you want, and you'll only then control Finn. Everyone else will follow the AI. And it's basically setting kind of how aggressive you want them to be, um, or you can have full manual control over everyone. So I usually went for the mild aggressive tactics called fight for mobs and manual for bosses. Didn't really use any of the other tactics. Didn't feel like I needed to. So this is pretty ordinary with, you know, physical attack or magical, use magic or use an item, you know, the standard stuff. But what comes next isn't. There is something called the active playing system, which basically just encourages you to mash the, mash the X button, as doing this may cause the character to perform some special action. This can range from guarding an attack so they take no damage to performing a double slash critical hit for huge damage. It's an odd system, but just keep mashing the X button and in hope of taking it, using it to your advantage. <laughs> That's basically it. It's, it's, it's weird, but it's there. <laughs> There's also the usual guys of the normal condition persuasion, so confusion, curse, paralysis, poison, etc. Pretty much what you'd expect. Nothing really out of the usual. It's a pretty simple system, really, and in most cases won't cause you any problems. What might cause you a problem is the quite high encounter rate, as this will really drain your resources. And even worse, affect your flow of thinking for puzzles. You'll be doing a puzzle and then hit a random encounter. You'll have thought of something, hit a random encounter. It really does break up your thinking. <laughs> And I'm someone who normally likes random encounters, but this game really does push it a bit. Normally I'd chuck in the Metacritic score, but this one's a bit old and was has never seen a re-release. So instead, from its wiki page, it seems to be getting low to middling ratings, which, yeah, seems fair. The game overall, as I said, was very generic and boring. Add on to that that it suffers from just being slow in motion, from sleeping in the inn to watching animations play, Everything just feels like it's moving slowly and just takes a bit too long. And then the dungeon length, like the dungeons with lengthy puzzles, frequent random encounters, it just slows you down even more. I went into it quite hopeful, as I love Camelot and their games, but this one is a rare miss from them. So my fa final rating is don't bother.